Hi, it's Cayman Reynolds, and we have a lot to talk about. We had an interesting live chat with Cameron Jack. I really enjoy getting to meet him. Have Michael Palmer coming up soon. Got a letter to read to you all and some more exciting news and the first of the experimental yard coming out. We're going to let some people come in real quick before we get going and also get to some questions and answers here shortly. Let's go ahead and write a few things down so I don't miss anything. Hello, time is honey, Nathan Potter. Laurel, are you going to share that on Facebook? All right, good deal, good deal. Hello, Dominican beekeeper. Hey, Brian Reese. All right, we got a lot to talk about. We'll go ahead and get started. So I've got some experimental yard information, and I am going to leave that in a copy down below. This is the oxalic acid group, and you can view that. I'm also going to have, so there's the link. I just posted it there. Good to see you, Jason McNally. Hope things are good up in Canada. But you can go to that link that I just posted right there, and that is going to send you to the oxalic acid sublimation or vapor test group. And I think you'll be able to see what went on. I'm going to have a paper, and then I'm going to have the rest of them coming soon and then you can compare those and the paper is going to be just details some of the finer details and uh, it's kind of colony sizes that kind of thing so whew, i'm out of breath it's been a, it's been a busy day um, so got a lot of exciting things coming up and i in wake of having cameron jack on who is a researcher out of florida I've been bombarded with questions. It's, it's never bad. I get a lot of questions, um, but many people were very concerned about oxalic acid based upon what he said. And you know, I didn't do any favors, I suppose, by making the, the thumbnail say oxalic acid is weak. However, it, I think the truth is in the middle. I mean, I definitely respect um, Dr. Cameron Jack and what they're doing down there. And I think they're doing important work, but at the same time, I don't agree with some of the results that they have. Um, I, I'm sure they had those results. They just, they, they haven't been my experience um, at all. And I, I don't think it's quite that weak. I don't think it's quite as strong as what a lot of people think either. And that's just my opinion though. And that's why we're going to keep doing this experimental yard, try to dial things in. Okay, that was weird, Nathan Potter. Lost your sound. And uh, let's take some questions first before we... I got several things here, but let's... If anyone has any questions, go ahead and go for it. I want to read an email real quick. Um, this is from Jennifer. Um, she's coming up to the TBA conference, the Tennessee Beekeepers Association conference, March 4th and 5th, where I will be speaking uh, three or four times. And they're coming all the way from Mississippi. So, wow, that's awesome. But she watched um, the videos about oxalic acid with Cameron Jack, and she's like, I was really hyped about its potential in my bee yard, and I purchased a vaporizer at the conference, but your latest video isn't sounding really promising for oxalic acid anymore. I haven't watched all of it yet, but did I make a bad decision? I know broodless is the time to use it, but is it not working well anymore? Any advice would be appreciated, and if I can oh, bring you all anything up from Mississippi, let me know. Well, uh, how about some shrimp etouffee? I'm just kidding. In all seriousness, I think you made a good decision. I love oxalic acid vapor in certain circumstances. We don't need to be losing any weapons or any tools in our arsenal for the mites. So I think it's a valuable one, but we need to understand it better. And it's obvious with the research that I just um, have gone through and, you know, which is, is not is comparable to you know the University of Florida, but they're not the only place that studies oxalic acid either. And it seems like the information is still this group over here is like this. I mean, it was, it was scientific research that said five rounds in 21 days would get you a 90% kill. My experience and research shows no. Theirs says definitely no. So the truth, we're, we're peppering around it, and we've got to keep 
we've got to keep at it until we dial this in. From what I understand, we're not even 100% sure how oxalic acid kills the mites. We have theories. All right. So <clears throat> for those of you who have just come in, um, about 75 of you right now, up above I have in the link that I posted above, I'm going to post another one right here. And you can go to that and see the spreadsheet for the oxalic acid test group. So that's the one that we have out right now. And thankfully, I ran it by a friend of mine who's definitely more versed in data gathering and was able to find a couple areas that I needed to get right. So it looks really good. Ralph says, do you think many beekeepers over tree? Um, no, Ralph, I don't think so. I, I very rarely think that someone, I, I can't ever think really of anyone that I know of who has over treated and seen damage on their bees unless they used a product incorrectly, like say formic acid in like 90, 95 degree Fahrenheit weather when it's not supposed to be used. Typically people under treat. That's what I see way more than over treating by and large. Is it possible that a mixture of vapor and drip might work better? Have you looked at this as part of the test going forward? Um, I have not looked into a combination like that. James, actually what I'm thinking this year is a little bit more realistic. So this year or this last year, it was just oxalic acid, brew break. And, and by the way, that information right there is with a brood break. So that was a big pain. If you're Cajun Queens, it's a lot of work. If you're counting all the bees out, it, this, it's all a lot of work. Thankfully, I have some people that are volunteering to help for this coming year. That's going to help me out so much and also make it a lot faster to get the information out. And again, this was my first year, so it took a little bit longer. It was first year for a lot of things. <laughs> um, but I think this coming year, what we're going to see, I haven't decided 100%, and I may actually release a survey on it like I did last year and see what people want. I'm thinking what we're probably going to do is have hybrids, like formic acid part of the year, oxalic acid part of the year. How often would be too often for oxalic acid? I don't know. There, are, There is research showing that every other day is okay. And honestly, I've treated a colony up to as many as 10 times. That's, I don't do that very often. That was for some testing. And you know what? The colony looked great after 10 rounds of treatment. It took, you know, a little bit of time. But I, I mean, oxalic acid to the bees, from what we can tell, is an irritant. It, you know, it's it's definitely not as good as you know, just air hitting the bees, but compared to oxalic acid getting over them, they have to brush it off and it irritates them a little bit compared to a mite that's on them and consuming their organs. I, I think that's a lot better. And so you definitely don't want to over treat and that's where the washes can help you out or sticky boards and things, but you definitely, it's over treating is better than under treating. And very few of us are over treating. Yeah, so Rob um, Rob says, Laura B says, I'm saying that wrong, Laura B says, came, came in your numbers are way higher than what they found. I'm curious if humidity or something like that could have been the difference. I don't know. We're very humid in August. We're not quite as humid in September, though, towards the end of it. So it could be the humidity. It just seems really really low i'm not 100 percent sure I, when he when he told me that they were thinking they were only going to get like 10 percent and let, let's focus on this i'm jumping around so cameron jack great conversation um you know the thing of it is if you look at randy oliver's work and some people say well randy oliver is not a scientist i say fiddlesticks to that randy has been wrong in the past but he's also been really right about several things in the past as well and you could argue that he actually does more of this stuff than a lot of the researchers do. 
you know, because he doesn't have all the protocols and the hoops and hurdles to jump through. But Randy sees better results with extended release than some of the universities do. He does live in a dry area. I think we definitely need, we just need more, 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 more research, and we're not getting enough of it. It's taken a long time to get it out. I think 10% as far as sublimation on a broodless colony, that's what doesn't make any sense to me. It sounded like Herman Jack was basically saying that if you have a broodless period and you hit them with oxalic acid vapor at one gram dose, you're only going to get around 10% kill roughly. I think that's way too low. Um, just my personal opinion on what I've tested over the years, what I've seen. Now, a lot of people will say you'll get 90 something percent kill with the brood break. I think that's way too high. And in the information, I'm going to post it again over here, paste it. And you can look at that chart for the oxalic acid group. You will see it's 52%, I think 52 or 53%. Let me look. 54%. Well, that's why you look at the numbers. 54% average reduction of mites. Oh, cool. I can actually see a bunch of people on here. Huh. I didn't know you could do that. And then I'm looking at the chart right now, and up top was the best, one of the best kills that we had, a 70%. We had an 84% reduction. We had, um, you know, lots of 40s and some 50s and 60s, but I didn't have any that were like way down the 10s and 20s or anything like that. Now, granted, I may have or may not have used too much oxalic acid. Um, colonies were treated with two grams per deep box, which is a little bit higher than what you're supposed to. I'm glad that I did, and it still didn't do quite as much. And these colonies were broodless. You can look at, at the time frames on it and how long they were um, broodless for, and we let them raise a round of brood before we did the last alcohol wash because the reason I, I think that I should have done that is let's say we do an alcohol wash and then we treat them um, after the queen's been caged for 21 days. But then as soon as we're done with the treatment, we um, let the queen out and then she starts laying and we do the, al the alcohol wash shortly afterwards, like within about 10 to 12 days. The problem with that is, is all the mites that we missed are going to be in the brood because they've been on the bees. So they're going to head for that brood. So most of them are going to be hidden. So I, that's why I wanted to wait till after they'd had a brood cycle afterwards. And and one thing that this graph does not show you is how small the clusters were in comparison to other colonies. We had a poor fall flow, which compounded the, th the whole thing. What I learned more, as much from this as anything is the fact that it's very labor intensive to cage colonies. And I'm sure that it can work, uh, cage queens, but if you don't have a flow coming up, then you're losing valuable B numbers. And it's going to be hard for the colonies to build back up and go into winter with a really large cluster. Besides the um, control group, definitely the smallest clusters coming out of winter. Mm, okay, I'm looking through the comments here. For a small hobby beekeeper with a, the bug smoker, which would be the insect fogger and alcohol mix, work for mites and Doug, I would say no. Um, it, it, it got really popular because of some YouTube videos and then, you know, people spreading, spreading it around. But the oxalic acid units that are designed for killing mites still aren't perfect. And those things work less. Um, as far as an alcohol mix and all that work, there's even, not even been any test. It's literally most of the fogger research that's done has been YouTubers searching for views and viral videos to make money and not in an effort to help beekeepers out. 
foggers probably should not be used. I mean, it's, it's a, it's illegal first and foremost. And I, that's, that doesn't concern me as much as does it actually work and is it actually safe? And, and this is where it gets a little tricky, the legalities of it. And before I forget, I got to say thanks once again to Steinthal um, for supporting us again. We really appreciate your donation and help keeping th these things going. And, and things like that are going now towards like having Michael Palmer and Cameron Jack on. So Michael Palmer will be the, let me double check, the 26th. I'm still confirming a time for him, but I'm imagining it's going to be 6 p.m. Central time based on our dialogue. And, you know, he's in Eastern time zone, so I imagine um, we don't want to get too late for him. Whew. Came in looking great tonight, man. You are going on a date later. Am I? A date? I, I don't know about a date. Oh, hey, Ian. Um, no, um, not, it's not 20 degrees some Fahrenheit or Celsius. It's uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't know what that is Celsius right off the top of my head. Hey, Larry. Good, good to have you on. A lot of people just popping in real fast. So I'm going to run through some things real quick. Going to post this down below if you have not seen. It's the oxalic acid test group. And I don't have the rest of them yet, but we are working on it. So uh, that link that I just posted down there, you can see the results from a brood break, two grams of oxalic acid, and a ton of counting of dead bees. Um, fun, fun. But I'm really glad I did. I, I learned a lot. Um, learned a lot going forward and working on this kind of thing. But yes, so... I said um, earlier that we had some people email me about the Cameron Jack talk and is oxalic acid even viable anymore? And I know Ian um, loves it in winter to clean up. I love it to clean up in winter. Um, Bob does as well. If it was only getting us, to, I mean, Ian, I mean, what do you think? And I mean this in a nice way. I, I, I loved getting to talk to Cameron and I look forward to doing something with him in the future. However, that does, I can still like somebody without agreeing with them. And I just, I have a very difficult time believing that I'm going to get 10% kill on a broodless colony that's not tightly clustered. If they were really tightly clustered, I could believe that. But if they're, if it's a loose cluster and I'm treating them with a good bit of oxalic acid, I, I'm getting more than 10% kill. I feel very, very confident of that. And I've, I've treated before when they were broodless and you just treat, 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 and you use a sticky board and eventually there's just might stop dropping. And if it was only 10%, then I would need to do a lot of treatments. So it, it's it's a complicated issue. But yes, keep using oxalic acid vapor. The takeaway from that talk, more importantly than anything, was to monitor and to test and see where you're at. Tim Tyus, Cayman, how much oxalic acid do you use per deep? Two grams. Two grams per deep. It's not what's legal. Um, and I'm not saying you should do it, but I thought it was, and that's what we did for the experimental yard. So not quite there yet. Is dribble any more effective than vapor? Um, yes, it is if you compare it to one gram the legal dose of dribble versus the legal dose of oxalic acid vapor, I believe you get more knockdown, yes. But Cameron says that once you start using up to four grams per deep box of uh, vapor, then you you get better kill and less um, a negative effect to the bees with the uh, than you would with the dribble. They, they both work. There's a lot of beekeepers that use oxalic acid dribble very successfully. It's, it's about experience and management. So Ian says, oxalic acid vapor has saved my operation. I'm, bru I'm brutalist treatment has regenerated my apivar. Good deal. All right. Yeah, hey, Don Summers and Natalie Summers. Good to have you all on. Good video the other day, lots of snow. So yes, the experimental yard information for the oxalic acid group is posted. Uh, Michael Palmer will be the 26th. I'm going to have Laurel post down below. So the, TN, the, 
The Tennessee Beekeepers Association Conference is March 4th and 5th. And that is going to um, be a good opportunity for you guys to get some wax dip boxes if you want some. I, don't, I think I'm going to be able to bring about 200. And it's only going to be pre-orders. I'm not going to sell any there and or have any extras. So if you're coming to the Tennessee Beekeepers Association Conference, you can pick some up there. We are going to be keeping keep an eye out for this. We are going to be dipping a handful of a few hundred more to sell. We're not going to be doing thousands or anything like that. So it's going to be a limited supply. We'll probably manage to dip 400 boxes, 500 boxes before spring. Nothing too crazy. So Laurel's going to put that link down below. Did you hear me, Laurel? She's, she's working on it. And if you're going to come to the TVA conference, you can just pick them up. Patties. All right. That was a question that I had that I needed to address. So that recipe that I posted this last week on the, what I'm going to do is call it the sugar recipe, the sugar pollen patty recipe, because if they're syrup derived, it's, it's a lot different. So this is those patties right here. And the texture is great. It's, this has been refrigerated since that video. I did make um, a couple batches. Hang on just one second. Hey, Laurel. Having some issues. Get back to the patties. So this this recipe was tweaked from Michael Palmer's original recipe. Um, it was when I originally got it from Michael years ago, it worked just fine. I need that link post to the wax dip boxes. OK, we'll just just post it again to where I can see it. Oh, OK, I see it. So there it is. Laurel has posted the link. If you're needing wax dip boxes, we'll be doing a couple of pickups here in Tennessee and you can get some nice Cypress wax dip boxes. Deeps and mediums are already assembled and everything. Hey, Ian. Um, yeah. So after um, the. Yeah, everything. The brood break, the whole nine yards. We actually scratched drone brood and everything. We got a 54% mite reduction um, after the one treatment, and we had no brood present. Um, some of them, as you can see, had higher levels than others. But um, as far as reduction, some of them were 70. One was 84%. Um, another 70 percent but by and large yeah some of them were in the 40s and 50. um keep in mind the one that with an asterisk that is um hive number three on the experimental yard oxalic acid group and all right here I, i'm i just sent put a link down there if you guys want to see that yeah it wasn't near as high as i thought it was going to be ian um i was i was a little surprised by that myself and you know we used more oxalic acid when we we're supposed to and so, where was I? Oh, yeah. Hive number three on that, that research. Um, and you'll notice on the left-hand side, you'll see a number like hive number one. It says A next to it. So if it says A, that's an Apame hive. If it says W, then that's a, a typical wax dip wooden boxed hive. The one with the asterisk was a colony that really struggled keeping a queen in it early in the season and never built up. Um, really large. It kind of built up late, big enough to, to do the research on, but that's my theory on why when we washed it with the rest of them, it only had a two on the um, mite count. And there was no other treatments at any time of the year given to these colonies, nothing else to reduce them. Um, we received the nukes in late April. And from that point on, they were just um, fed and built up. Um, there was no other treatments besides this one on the colony. And of course, this is, you know, this is just what I've observed. This is my first year doing any research, and I am not claiming to be an expert. I'm learning as much about doing these things as I am about um, the rest of it. So hopefully long term, um, I can contribute into learning more about my bees and what's working for me and help dial things in for myself and maybe I can help dial in for some other people too. All 
All right, so the Dominican beekeeper said, my pollen patties often get dried and moldy in the colony. Is there anything I can do to prevent this? Um, well, it sounds like if they're getting dried, they need something to keep them um, more moist. And of course, if the bees eat them fast, that always helps. A Canadian beekeeper's blog, were there yards around that may have resulted in drift? No significant beekeepers around that I know of, Ian. We don't have a lot of big beekeepers in this area. The nearest beekeeper that I know of that has more than like two hives is myself, which I had the yard spaced out almost four miles apart. That might not be far enough. And I really tried to keep the other yards treated very well just because I try to do that anyways. Um, but that doesn't mean there wasn't some outside factors. There, and there could be a beekeeper that I don't know of that has 20 hives a mile down the road. I mean, you just don't know around here. There's so many hills. However, um, yeah, that could be a factor. And I don't even know how to account for that at this point. But as far as the patties go, let's talk about that real quick and then I'll move on. So that video on the, the Palmer patties, originally it did not call for the gelatin, but I really felt like it, it benefited from it. My bees have been eating it good. I actually took a little bit of a um, video and I'm really shocked at how many small hive beetles are in the, the hives um, right now in February. It's, it's quite insane. But I'm really happy with the texture. So I've got a batch coming out of the freezer. I hadn't tried that yet. People have asked me what's the best way to store these patties in between use if you don't use all of it. So here we have five and about a half pounds. It's stored in the Ziploc bag. It's super soft and moist. And I know some people hate it when you use that word, but that's what you want. You, you want your patties to dry out. The gelatin, I think, really helps give it the texture that you want. It helps retain that water content in there, which is important to keep them from drying out. And that's also why there's the vegetable oil. So if you haven't seen that video and you don't have access to cheap inverted syrups, I think it's the way to go. Um, if you have access to cheap inverted syrups, that's awesome. I love making patties with inverted syrup. But if you have to ship that to you, it's very expensive. Um, but st so far, the storage in the refrigerator is fantastic. I imagine you can store this for a very long period because of the high sugar content in your fridge. Um, I'm going to keep this in my fridge for a couple months and see how it smells and looks. Um, I haven't talked to my wife about storing it in the fridge that long. So as long as I don't get vetoed, that will um, be part of the test on these patties. And I also have some in the freezer. It'll be interesting to see if there's any separation as well with the freezer and this. If they, Because the, the thing we don't want is them to get runny either and run out between. And that's what was happening with Michael's. They were, they were really runny after Man Lake changed the recipe. And they're just running right out of the parchment paper. Have you used lard in any of your patties? No, um, I have not. Um, and I, I would be concerned. You know, the, the gelatin is just such a small amount. There's so few ingredients in gelatin as far as, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of roughage in it. And we're feeding it at a time of the year the bees can get cleansing flights. It also has some protein content. And we're adding just that little packet, and that's it. But it just swells up good, and I think it does. I think it does good for the patties. When mixing the patties with a small cement mixer, do a decent job of mixing the patty. I have been told if you use a cement mixer, you need to throw all of the ingredients in at once. Now, I would say if you were using the gelatin, I would mix that with the water first. But then I've heard that you need to mix them all together at once, otherwise it doesn't mix good. Now that's just word of mouth. I've never tried it myself. Um, a bucket and a drill works really good to make a um, about 50 pounds at a time. Um, a drill with a paint stir attachment. Hey, Stone Mountain Apiaries. Thanks for the feedback on the new pollen patty recipe. Um, I really want to keep patties as affordable as possible. And that's the nice thing about these right here. If you buy you know, Ultra B at full price, and then you can get sugar around the price that most Americans can, um, you know, some of us pay more than others, but I can get it in the 40 something cent range. And if you, you do all the math on that, I, I paid like 90 odd cents a pound. It was under a dollar a pound for these. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a good price, as opposed to if you purchase 
patties from Man Lake, you're going to pay about two and a half dollars a pound to have them shipped to your door. So that can save you a little bit of money. And they, they work really good. I checked on them. I put some in a colony and they've been in there for five days and they have not dried out at all. I'm, I'm really actually shocked by that because patties usually that have a lot of sugar in them dry out. And that's that's a difference. The invert syrup brings in moisture. Sugar dries them out. But I think the gelatin's helping quite a bit. I'm sure they'll eventually dry out if they're left in there long enough. So, yes, the TBA, March 4th and 5th. If you're in Tennessee, I urge you to come and the surrounding regions, but especially Tennesseans. The Tennessee Beekeepers Association is really trying to change some things around. We got a new president, new people involved, and a, just a lot, a lot of folks getting involved. And that's why I, I need you to get involved, because we're trying to change things here in Tennessee. Tennessee's been not always bad, but they haven't been good. Very lazy, in my opinion, when it comes to trying to really push things forward. And I feel like the right people are in place, but the more people we have working towards that, the easier it will be. And if you have concerns or things you would like to see changed in the state of Tennessee, then please come to the TBA conference March 4th and 5th. I'll be speaking multiple times and you don't have to do it just to listen to me. Um, you can bring tomatoes and throw them. I, I'm really good at dodging. Yeah, um, Galaxy, if, it would be good to um, to treat them. Um, maybe do a wash of some sort and see what's going on. There was a fellow that posted recently in Facebook in one of the bigger groups and you know said, why do I have a dead out? And posted a bunch of pictures of some good combs. And you could tell that what stores they had had been robbed out. He was like, you know, what happened? Why did the colony dwindle to be able to be robbed out? And then he sampled some of the dead bees on the bottom of the hive and did a and separated out the mites and was shocked by how many mites were down there amongst the bees. And you can overwinter quite a few mites. And a lot of people don't just realize how quickly they can build up in the late summer and the damage they do to the colony. So if, if you can treat them, that would be good. Greg Hill says, can you use flour to thicken it up? The problem is when you start using stuff like flour, Greg, is you're diluting the protein content down and you're also adding roughage to it. We really, you know, basically with these patties, the, the, the main ingredients is, is sugar. So we got the carbs in there for energy. Um, the Ultra B is high in protein and, you know, has a, a lot. You know, people don't realize a lot of times how many minerals go into these supplements. I'm not saying Ultra B is perfect, but there yeah are several amino acids that if they are not present um, are an issue and the bees will not build up properly. And so there's basically water, ultra bee, there's a little bit of vegetable oil to keep it a little bit more, uh, keep it from drying out. And then there's the sugar and now just a tiny packet of gelatin. So could you use flour? Maybe so, but how much are you getting the recipe out of balance. We want a certain degree of uh, protein content to help our bees build up. Pollen is coming in here in Tennessee, by the way. Hmm. Reading through questions here. Oh, thanks for the words up above, Greg. I just saw those. It would be nice to know just how long mites stay out of the brood cell after they initially emerge. I'm not sure if anyone has any definitive data on that, but I believe someone was looking into that a while back. And it's probably not very long. Not very long at all. Can you use a little jello for the gelatin? Carl, maybe you can. Yeah, it would be it would be a lot better though if you could find it. Um, if you if you look at the video, I don't know if they have that. I think you're in Australia, if I remember, Carl. Maybe no, maybe you're a different Carl. Uh, but you can get that stuff really cheap. Those little um, gelatin packets. I think Laurel said if you buy a, a box of those, they're like thirty something cents a piece or something like that. I cannot I can't remember if it's a big box. It's even cheaper than that. But. 
but you probably could maybe use a, a box of jello but i don't know what all they throw in that and i would, I would be concerned well so um i'm probably going to butcher this alhambra orchard and apiary how about baker's yeast to thicken it as it would increase protein and you're right it would thicken it and brewer's yeast um, would have some protein in it but it also is going to cause them to dry out more as well. And that's one of the biggest problems with the recipe that doesn't have invert syrup is it wants to dry out. So we're trying to add something to it that's not going to change the content that much and it's going to keep it from drying out. So I, that's where I would be concerned using something like that. But you know, brewer's yeast has been used a lot in the past for, for patties. If I had the time, I would love to sit down and formulate my own recipe. I mean, realistically speaking here, if I spent all of this coming year or six months of it focused on making a pollen patty that was real, you know, it was, it was a good serviceable patty, it probably wouldn't be any better than what I could buy. And by the time I spent all that time and energy, I could have just bought it in the first place. Here in the United States, we have access to affordably, affordable subs. Um, you know, in other countries, it's it's a harder to source, and I get that. But at our conference this year, you could get Ultra B, especially if you pre-ordered. And I actually talked to someone today about this. You could get Ultra B for thirty dollars off a bag at our conference. So if you need three bags of that, that's a lot. That's a lot of savings right there. That's more than what you can get when they do their ten percent off sale. And we're going to be doing our best to have that again this coming year and then some on the deals. So uh, if you're thinking about coming to our conference, um, definitely be watching out for the deals because you can save even more on those kind of things. I talked to somebody today about getting Ultra B because there wasn't as much of it there as we hoped. But he mentioned that he called them afterwards saying that there wasn't any there and they honored it anyways and gave him and, and paid for the shipping. So he got the discount and didn't have shipping added to it do you have any data oh it just jumped on me mm. do you know of any new data using sponges for oxalic acid usage yes randy oliver is posting stuff i say posting submitting stuff to the american bee journal on a frequent basis I would subscribe to the, if I was going to pick a, a journal to go to for beekeeping, it would be the American Bee Journal, and primarily because of Randy Oliver. So he is doing research on the oxalic acid extended release, and hopefully, he, he, some of his trials show some promise, and other people's trials have not. Could it be the dry California weather? I don't know. I'm hoping, and it's, if anybody knows anything about how to submit stuff for EPA approval in the state of Tennessee, I'm, I'm needing to look into that if we are going to have oxalic acid extended release trials for this coming experimental yard, which I would like to do. But Randy Oliver is the only one that I know of that has done um, extensive work on it. And what little work I have seen from some of the universities um, has not yielded as good of results. But the, the, I, I don't think that we have a definitive answer on anything right now. And it's really frustrating. <laughs> uh, Bradford Stringed Instruments. Uh, that's funny. Um, looking for work. Um, thanks for watching our videos. And you, Stringed Instruments, huh? Do you have a, a music shop? I, I, I do love music. Already made splits in South Carolina. Goodness, Walker B. Ranch. Ahead of us by a few weeks, that's for sure. A month. Chad Fay, just used your recipe and made some beautiful patties. You were right about using a heavier built drill. Thought I was going to burn up my Makita. Yikes. Well, and maybe you warm it up next time um as much as you can just get the ingredients warmed up it's it's hard because a lot of the ingredients are dry so but you just take it low and slow corn starts to thicken patties and valis i think it would dry it out and i'm not sure 
what all that adds to it. I like the gelatin because it adds protein. And I also like it that it retains the water and gives us the texture where cornstarch is going to dry it out. So Rob with Laura B's um, says, how many treatments ac across how many days? So Rob, that was only one treatment. So I'm going to um, put the link down again for the oxalic acid test yard. And you guys can click and look at that at the date. If you have any questions, um, leave them to the side. Um, and I will try to see and get to all of those. There was only one treatment for that. That was it. We made the colony broodless and then we treated one time. That was it. So I've got some really exciting news, everybody. This one really put a smile on my face today. Now, things can happen, but I'm going to give you guys a little sneak peek on the um, Hive Life Conference. Um, Paul Kelly just emailed me back and said, yeah, he would really like to come. And if nothing changes, plans to be at our Hive Life Conference for 2023. So that is really exciting. Um, I've, I enjoy um, the work that they do up at the University of Guelph. And I think that um, Paul is um, a good speaker and also um, a nice guy. So that'll be a lot of fun to meet him in person in 2023. Hey, Pierce Beekeeping Equipment, we were talking about some of your um, product today. Actually, I was talking last night about it. I talk about you guys all the time. Um, my One of my buddies is looking into buying your new um, cut comb cutter, the two by four cut comb cutter, um, and then... I was talking about the uncapping tank of yours um, to somebody today as a, as a good option for beekeepers that don't want to drop six, seven, eight hundred dollars for an uncapping tank, but can still get something very useful and long lasting. Hmm, let's see here. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dave, if you'd like to do that, and that'd be just fine. Hmm. So Chad says, does anyone know if Permacomb is still in business? I think they've taken a break. I don't know if they've gone out of business. It's just from a standpoint of plastic has gotten so expensive and it's been really in short supply. So maybe they decided to take a little hi hiatus or whatever, however you say that. Yeah, Rob. So... And again, it was just my experience. Um, I don't know if that's average across the board. Of course, Cameron Jack said less than that. But Bob treats three times in winter. I treat two times in winter. And I felt like the, two, the second treatment was worth it. And Bob feels like three is worth it. I think it's a really good treatment. It's very clean. It is a little labor intensive if you're doing thousands of colonies, but you kind of you kind of are slow during the winter anyways. I really do like oxalic acid as a, a tool. We just need to better understand how it works. And maybe if we can get approval to eventually use three or four grams a deep box, then that could really change the game. Maybe we've just been un under applying it for a long time. However, there's nothing illegal right now about doing this. This is what is kind of frustrating about the whole legal thing. It just you can legally go in and treat your colony Monday with one gram, Tuesday, one gram, next day, one gram, next day, one gram. You see where I'm going with this? Totally legal. Why can't you just do four grams in one shot? You know, now, I, of course, they probably don't want you doing four grams, four grams, four grams, four grams, back to back to back. But at the at the same time, it, it's it's a legalities are, are kind of frustrating, especially when they don't make sense. Welcome to the United States of America. Have you ever heard of having a bee entrance on the warm side of the hive entrance is on the side of the hive instead of on the front of the hive? Um, Valis, I've heard of having your colonies rotated to get that um, early morning sun to get them out and working faster, which should make them a little bit more productive because of, you know, maybe they get more active 30 minutes quicker than or more, you know, over the course of a honey flow or an important 
part of the season, that could make a big difference. How big of a difference? I don't know. Now, if you're talking about something specifically on having an entrance on the side of the hive, I really don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pierce, um, Walker B Ranch is um, in California and has been there since 1940s, making all their stuff in the United States and still do. Question for Ian. Ian, are you still on? Um, James McNally has a question for you. I may be thinking way out there, but has anyone ever thought of making an oxalic acid liquid treatment and then doing something with it to mist or steam steam it through the hive? I've actually thought of that. Um, I'm sure other people have too. I think that there could be something to that. Would it not be interesting and awesome if there was a device you could put onto the hive and it had like different burn chambers or, or, or a loading device, and that would automatically, over an extended period of time, burn so much oxalic acid every day or maybe every other day. Or maybe if it was a liquid form, like you're saying, you could have a, a device. And this I was actually thinking about this with thymol the other day. What if, because thymol off gases, and like apigard is thymol and bees track it through the hive. But what if you had a low dose and you had a device that literally just dripped it maybe twice a minute or something? I don't know. And so as it's dissipating throughout the colony, it's still applying some. It'd have to be you know, regulated so you didn't overdose the colony on the thymol. But then you could have it literally there treating all 21, 24 days of the brood cycle. And instead of having, because I think sometimes you have strong colonies that get to the, the apigard and they yank it out so fast. And so you don't get as long of a treatment period. And that's why I prefer doing the apigard um, once a week for three weeks, as opposed to doing it um, the recommended dose of two times um, of the 50 grams, because I think it's, it spreads it out and you cover the varroas a little bit more. But that we've got to get creative. Um, we need to do it um, smart and safe and legal, but we we as beekeepers have got to figure some things out. Um, you know, if, if Apivard lets us down and eventually goes the way of the dodo, then we're left with formic acid, thymol, hop guard, oh my goodness, and oxalic acid and, you know, just a, a thing or two. You know, we're we're kind of running out. All right, so Houston's got a question on the chart. For those of you who have just come in, I'm going to post it again. I'm putting a link down here, and you can see the Oxalic Acid Experimental Yard test group. And you can go and observe that. And so the colony number seven, and you'll see that there's letters next to the numbers. So if it's seven, it'll have a W next to it. That means it was a wooden hive. If it was has an A next to it, that's an Apame hive. Um, number seven was a dead out via swarm. So it swarmed early in the season and became queenless. And I tried, but I was never able to get that colony queen right. I tried over an extended period of time. And so that colony um, just was a dead out. It got hopelessly queenless and it would have gone into a lane worker situation. So um, we just um, took that out of the, the test. Colony three. Um, with the asterisk next to it was a colony that also had some queen issues that superseded early and just had a hard time building up and eventually built up big enough to treat with the rest of them and, and do a little bit of the experiment. But I, I had that asterisk there because I, I'm pretty confident that's why the mites were so low is because they just uh, never, they, they never had a big colony population and had so many basically brood breaks throughout the season. And there's research showing this, um, you know, wild bees, quote unquote, wild bees, and research that has gone in to show colonies that are allowed to swarm actually have lower mite counts. You just, you're breaking up the cycle. You're slowing down reproduction. It makes sense. However, if you're trying to produce honey, you're trying to make splits, and you're trying to overwinter really strong colonies, that's counterproductive. And one thing I will say 
is we didn't get the results that we hoped to get. And then on top of that, the work that was involved in, you know, you've got to cage the queens and then you've got to release them. And oh, by the way, you've lost so much population because you've had this big gap. I believe if you did this and then you had a flow after it, a nice pollen flow and the bees were able to build up off of that, it would have worked real good. Problem is, if you do this and you don't have a fall flow and now your bees are going into winter, you're going into winter with little bitty clusters instead of nice big ones like I like to see. I like seven, eight, nine frame clusters, at least six frame clusters. I don't like it when I see three and four frame clusters. If I were to use natural pollen in the mix, should I use less Ultra B? Yeah, Brandon um, Parker, just make sure it's irradiated pollen if it's not your own. Because you can buy pollen, and if it hasn't been irradiated or something like that, then you could be spreading disease. But if it's your own pollen, I wouldn't worry about it, unless it was from a disease colony. And uh, what if, say, you put in half a pound of pollen, I would take out a half a pound of Ultra B. That's what I would do. But I also wouldn't put pellets in there, like dried pellets of pollen. I would gently grind that into a powder. And someone was asking me the other day, why can't we just use cornmeal and different things to piece these together? Cornmeal is still really large, just general cornmeal. It needs to be fine. Um, Ultra B is ground really fine. It, it aids the digestion for the bees uh, significantly. So it, it also, there's a lot to making a sub. Yeah, Forrest Edwards, someone could build that, but would charge you $1,000 for each unit. Probably so. We need, then that's the trick too, is someone's got to invent something that is commercially viable. And, you know, some people get upset on how everything's so commercialized, but at the same time, if it's going to take so much money to legally use something, or maybe if you can find something that is legal to use, it's got to, it's still got to be affordable. It's got to be practical. I can't be spending $300 a hive. I've got to have something that's reasonable. It's It's got to be affordable. It's got to be effective. It's got to be safe. It's got to be so many things. And it's, it's mites we're talking about. Very complicated. Yeah, James McNally. Um, so now that, now that you've, you know what I'm talking about, even though I don't know what you're, uh, you're talking about with the oil and gas sector, um, you're going to rig one of those up, right? <laughs> uh, I just volunteered you. Uh, but seriously, um, it's a huge challenge. But if somebody could create, even if it's using the same products that are already legal, but could take it and make them more effective in a, a semi-affordable manner, if you could find something that would work good and that was affordable and sell it, you can make some money. And you can advertise it right here because if it actually works, I'm all over that because I want to use it myself. And, you know, we're here to try to help beekeeping as much as possible. Keep the networking going, all that kind of stuff. So just like having Paul Kelly down here and um, at the next Hive Life conference, that is super exciting. Um, I think I've wanted to meet him for um, several years. Got a lot of questions to ask him. And they've also done a lot of research up there as well. So that's one of the reasons I want to talk to him is... Uh, See if I can learn a thing or two. Maybe save myself some time. Yeah, and my thoughts are, so thymol is a product that's available to us in a lot of forms, just like oxalic acid. And, and let's be honest here, how many of us are actually using apophyoxal? Um, and they know that, you know, and they know that. And I want to do things safe in the right way, but they make it so expensive to do it their way, and half the time it doesn't work. But thymol is a product that I think has potential, but I'm wondering if the Apigard is the best delivery method. I don't know. 
Sometimes I wonder if a slightly lower dose than what Apigard has, because that's what I've been using, right? I don't do their full 50 gram dose. I do like a 33 gram dose, 30, 33 gram dose once a week for three weeks. But I wonder, again, if you had something that was a lower dosage, maybe even like 20 something grams, it had a delivery where it was extended out a little bit longer. I mean, basically, you could have like Apigard and like a, a little device that periodically just squeezes out a little bit more, like every two or three days, just automatically squeezes some more out. And then you get a more even consistent treatment. I don't know. I'm just I'm spitballing ideas. Somebody please invent something. Can you, can you hear the desperation in my voice? Did you end up having an inventor's corner to your conference? Was there was there some cool stuff? Yeah, there was a few things. Um, we had like four items. There wasn't. It was neat and it was good. I'm hoping that we'll have more in the future. And there's a few people that weren't able to make it this year due to some border restrictions and also. Um, some people were local and just um, weren't able to show up. But yeah, we did have some, and we just started it out. I have high hopes that in the coming years that will grow and that we also can have it within our budget to um, give a significant award or something, 500, maybe a thousand dollars, something that really will kind of encourage people to be creative. I don't know. We got to figure out a way to get more innovation. And, and I mean, goodness, if they can sell millions of dollars with a flow hive, surely somebody can invent a practical tool that actually helps save the bees and actually de-stresses the bees. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more helpful and we can, we can encourage them to do that. We, there's the people will pay money for it. Maybe they won't pay tens of millions of dollars like they would for a flow hive, but maybe you can make a million dollars or something. When do you typically start grafting queens? So I start grafting queens usually around the first week of April. A lot depends on the season and the weather, but if, if weather's normal, about first week of April, start grafting queens. You can do it a little bit earlier than that. And it's not so much about grafting the queens. You can graft, I can graft them in March. That's not an issue and get them to draw the cells out. It's a matter of the queens being able to mate. So I feel like the first First of April is a, is a good time. Some years I could probably do it two weeks earlier and get the queens made of good. I, there's nothing more than I, that I hate is getting that early jump on the season, putting all that work in, making the mating nukes, doing all that work. And then you get a, some bad weather and you get very low takes or you get poor, poorly mated queens. So I think that waiting a, a week or two into the first week of April is wise. Now that's, I'm in Northern Tennessee. So if you're like in Memphis or Chattanooga, you could probably do it 10, you know, easily the last week of March or maybe the second week of March. Cayman, is anybody doing research that might develop row mites that produce infertile offspring? That could go a long way over time to eliminating them altogether. Not that I know of on a serious basis. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. DC... Accuracy says, um, oh, no, sorry. Um, he said, DC Accuracy says, Max, reduce them down there. Okay, that, that wasn't talking to me. Hansbury said, um, we need to silent auction Paul Kelly's hat. I don't know. He might be really sentimental to that hat, but maybe we can swipe it from him and get him to autograph it. So Chad asks, when, when is next year's conference and what's the fee? We're going to try to keep the fee the same if possible. Um, which was 180 um, as, as last year. However, we're just going to have to see what the conference will um, charge us. I have no clue. Um, but next year's conference is going to be January 6th and 7th. And if you buy a lot of B equipment, you probably can pay for your ticket um, and maybe your hotel room as well in the process of coming to the conference. Just depends on what you buy. Um, be prepared for that because we'll have more deals than we had last year. And we had quite a few, lots of products. And 
the, the guys that did the best were the ones that said, okay, well, I can't, you know, get the 20% off Premier Foundation or something like that. But then they pulled in with their, their B club, allow them to get you know, multiple people to work together. And maybe only one person would show up, but then they'd have two people at their B club that said, hey, if you'll pick up a thousand sheets of foundation, I'll buy 400, you buy 200, other guys going to buy 400. And we'll get the 20% off on Premier Foundation and the free shipping. And there were people that did that. Um, so, yeah, there's there's still opportunities, even if you're not able to come. And um, news on that, uh, I should have the um, edited video here within a week. And then we can get that up to where anyone who didn't come to the conference will be able to um, purchase that and view it. Um, it's, once I find out how much the company who's going to manage selling those for me is going to charge me. I will have an idea on what that's going to cost. Um, it should be very reasonable though. James McNally, they use these in greenhouses for delivery, fertilizer and hydroponic systems. And see, that's what we need. We need something like that. We actually need people from outside the bee industry, I think, to make some really positive changes. If we look at the extractor, if we look at a lot of the innovations that have come to the industry, they were from people that had experiences in other work environments and it had used centrifuges, centrifuges, I can't say that, centrifuge, I can say that. And uh, they would use those though for other industries and they thought, why can't we use this for honey? And then the extractor was born. So sometimes you just need a fresh set of eyes. Um, and man, did we have some small high beetles on some colonies when I checked them today, there must've been 60 or 70. and the first one I opened. Brian Reese, thanks, man. I, man, I really appreciate you. Um, I know you mentioned that you were wanting some wax dip boxes, so um, you know how to get a hold of me uh, if you need any more of those. I know you picked some up at the conference, but if you do need any more, just let me know and we will figure out how to get those to you. Hmm, all right, back. So let, let me go over some of the things we talked about real quick. So Michael Palmer, the 26th. So that's coming up the 26th of February. So that's a week from today. He'll be coming on. Um, just be watching for that time frame. I'm going to try to do a little bit of a different talk than I did with Cameron or anybody else. And I'm just going to ask him a lot of questions. He's done a lot of PowerPoints over the years and kind of specific stuff. I, I really want to just let Michael talk and just ask him some questions about how he got to where he is today. Some of the people that mentored him, what he would like to, to say to beekeepers about treating mites and managing an operation, because even if you're not managing thousands of colonies, you can still learn a ton from these guys. Bob's a great example of that. So I'm, I'm going to try to, if you guys have any questions, send them to me beforehand. It makes it a heck of a lot easier then the, the feed over here, and, and this feed's fine and, and great, but sometimes I, I miss a lot of them. So if I have them beforehand written down on me, and they're, you know, I can just make sure I don't miss. Hey, Stone Mountain Apiaries, I appreciate the feedback on the saying that you covered your ticket and hotel with the savings from the conference. Appreciate that. And, and we plan on doing a whole lot more this year. We this last year, we were figuring a ton of stuff out. Now we know a lot of what to do. Should be able to do a lot more. And it's, um, again, thank you to Brian Reese and Steinthal Apiaries because, you know, guys like um, Michael and, oh, what's his name? Um, Cameron Jack. I always want to call him Jack Cameron. You know, they, they, they cost to come on, but it's totally worth it. And so it just makes us able to do more of these things. Hey, yeah, James McNally, if you're able to bring that queen grafting table, do that. Um, I have that in one of my queen rearing videos, and it is a really nice queen grafting table. And, um, and you, so you can you know, bring that down and show that off and let people know um, where to get those grafting tables. And hey, if you if you invent something um, that treats Varroa good, we're going to love, we're, everybody will love you. Let me tell you. I sent my clock to catch Michael Palmer. Sorry, Cayman. He was the key speaker two years ago at a B school. 
yeah, Michael Palmer's the guy. I'm just hoping he's, he's kind of mentioned coming to our conference. I think he's still a little concerned about getting out and about, and that's all right. You know, he's, um, he's, we've talked about this, him and I, um, him and his wife, you know, they're some, they have some health issues. And so it, it's a, it's a concern. Um, but I'm hoping that um, things will be more comfortable for him to be able to come and we can, I've, I've never met Michael Palmer and I, I, it's one of the things that I would really like to, to do and to experience. So, you know, you guys might not be able to get to talk to Michael. I might hog him all to myself. How do you apply oxalic acid? I, I use an oxalic acid vaporizer. You can use a Laura B vaporizer, like I have a video on, or you can use a ProVap. You can just buy two of the Laura, basically for the price of the ProVap. Brad Witt says, hi from Omaha, off topic. My wife thinks you have a relaxing voice, easy to listen to. Wow. Someone key the smooth jazz music. I, I can't believe this. Laurel, is my voice soothing? No. No, works for eh, whatever. Jeez, it, it's old. It's old hat. You know, all jokes aside, that I appreciate that comment. Um, I never would have thought. Hmm. I am going to post a link down below again for the oxalic acid experimental yard information. There'll be more coming on the experimental yard stuff in the future. Um, Houston asked a question. Are you going to try the test yard again this season? Yes, totally. And we're going to do a better job of it too. More videos. Um, I really struggled with counting all of the bees this year. It was a lot more labor than I thought it was going to be. I already have some guys lined up to help me though this coming year. So on those big days when um, it's busy season, I can have a crew of guys and we can count because we, you know, we count all the bees. If you, so if you look at that oxalic acid test group page, you can see how many bees we counted, how many mites, and then of course the percentage and then the comparisons of coming back post treatment. And then overall the total percentage of reduction so i'm going to be kind of sharing this um, with a couple of the guys that i know that, that that do research and i'm sure they are going to have some constructive criticism on better ways to go about this but honestly for my first time i, I felt like this chart was about as good as i could do it um, without a lot of experience so i will get better as time goes on have you reached out to Humberto from Inside the Hive TV for next year's conference? I have not yet, John. We have Well, we've talked about it in the past. Um, I know Humberto, this last conference, was concerned about, um, you know, the coronavirus and, and things regarding that. So, you know, I, understandable. Um, but I haven't talked to him recently. I'm, I'm planning to do something with him in the future. It's just one of those things we've both been busy and we neither one of us have got it done. Who's your favorite bluegrass band or singer? So for those of you who don't know, I love bluegrass. Uh, I played a lot in the past. Um, we used to think about being a professional um, bluegrass musician, which does not make much money. Um, that's for sure. But my favorite group, that would be hard. There's several. I, some, somebody that's really not fully bluegrass, but as awesome as Allison Krauss in Union Station. I love Allison Krauss in, in Union Station. And Dan Tominski and Allison Krauss, all of them um, back during their biggest heyday, Jerry Douglas, Killer Band. I love um, especially Ricky um, Skagg stuff in around 2000, prior to about 2010. Um, I still like Ricky Skaggs, but as far as an off-the-wall band that's not in existence anymore, Mountain Heart. The original Steve Goley, who unfortunately is no longer with us, and um, those, those guys were unbelievable. I got to be in the same camper as them. And listen to them play it's it's almost it's it's unbelievable how good they are it's insane it puts me to sleep hey john hey john watch it man watch it look like a young chuck norris i i'll take that all right i where are these compliments coming from i'm liking this this is a whole lot better than what i got off of the cameron jack video after that video man i got 
I got I got some nasty comments. You know, these these, these people are awesome. Um, Ian, no, um, they did not. Um, they they were not as good as what I hoped with the you know the thymol and the formic acid. Now, well, did, did the other treatment types? Yes, the other treatment types were better. The um, control yard had very lousy results too. Like so lousy, there's not very many of them alive. I think two out of 13 is what we have now. I believe that's correct. Three out of 13, two out of 13. So very low percentage of survival. That's what the control was. I don't have the data um, completely figured out. So on the, like, you know, oxalic acid was 54% average. I'm going to take a guess, and the thymol, I believe, is in the low 80s. And the formic is not too far off based upon the washes, but I have not punched all the numbers like I have for this. I mean, I just, just got done punching these numbers um, earlier this week. And I was, and I was going to have it in Cameron Jack's video. The reason I did not is because we got talking beforehand, and I realized that if I brought the experimental yard into it, originally my, my idea was I'd bring it in and he would bring in some of their research and we could compare them, but he didn't have his research in a way that was really shareable like that. And if you go and look at some of the links to the research, you know, it's great, but man, there's just so much verbiage and technicalities and stuff. I just really want nuts and bolts. What were the results in, in, in layman's terms? I understand that's their world. My world is my bees need to stay alive and be healthy. So I, I decided not to do it because I also felt like it was going to take away from getting to ask him questions and people getting to get some of their questions asked at the end. Because if I posted my stuff, people would start asking experimental yard questions and then it ended up being more about the experimental yard than it was about Cameron Jack. So that's why I decided to post it a few days later. <laughs> a dry cut points for creativity so is there a discount for next year's ticket or something lots of flattery in the chat tonight hilarious so carl says i, I sound totally tennessean that's interesting because i was born in indiana and a lot of tennesseans feel like i still sound somewhat like a yankee it really depends on who i'm talking to um, i think i can kind of go in between. I don't sound like a really strong Southern speaker at all, but I also don't sound like a Yankee. So if I go up North, they think I've got a draw. If I go down South, they think I'm a Yankee. I feel like Kentucky and nobody wants me. Ooh, did I just do that? <laughs> it's, it's a little Civil War joke. Sorry. Yeah, Nickel Creek, back in the early years, Nickel Creek Thomas was, I really liked Nickel Creek. Nothing is free. All those compliments will cost. Hey, um, S. Um, Chen, I don't. I think I don't think I'll get your name, but I appreciate you from India watching, and uh, hope you are doing good over there in India. So yeah, there's no discounts on flattery, at least right now. Um, we'll look into that as, as the future. Um, trust me when I say, though, that we're, we're going to do our best to keep it affordable and to, if we can't keep it, you know, if we can't drop the price, so we're, we're doing what we can to create deals and, and different opportunities for you there at the conference and to try to make it as awesome as possible. You know, having guys like Paul Kelly um, would be awesome. You know, we, we might get Ian Stepler if we feel desperate, um, you know, something like that. Um, I know Bob's coming back. Bob's planning on actually having, you know, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but he's he's supposed to have a booth this year from his company. So he's he's planning on having some of their stuff there. So that will be really cool. You know, Bob does everything really awesome. Except talk really loud. Um, that's that's actually the only thing I can think of. Um, we are working hard on. I'm 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 seriously thinking of double micing Bob next year. It's an issue. 
Um, but we, we've got a lot of stuff going on, and I don't have 100% the, the lineup filled out so far, but we are looking at getting the best speakers and personalities there and make it as much fun. It's going to be great having two rooms going because we're going to have advanced stuff over here, stuff for smaller beekeepers over here, and we can get more things covered for more people, and we're going to need to. Um, but it's also... Excuse me. It's, it's also very expensive to put these things on. I didn't realize how expensive, um, you know, getting Paul Kelly down here is not cheap. That hotel that you stay in there next door, if you stay at that one, that is not cheap either. And you start adding these up and before long, you're, you know, way over two grand into a speaker, which is which is fine. These guys are worth it, but you know, it takes money to make that happen. Well, oh, come on, Bradford String Instruments. You, you got you to gotta play a different tune now. Get what, See what I'm doing there? Uh, you got you to, you next joke has to be um, something else. Yeah, the shed might be a little dangerous, just might be. Hmm. Look. Bob is the go. He is awesome, you know, and that's what I'm hoping. I've got a guy I was talking to yesterday who's a, another commercial operator who I think is like Bob in the fact that he's got a ton of experience. Um, he cares about the beekeeping industry. But, you know, Bob, prior to YouTube, did not have a platform a significant to, to make significant changes. And now he realizes that's available so I'm, I'm hunt, trying to hunt down some guys that are like Bob that can also bring stuff to the table. And for a change, the beekeepers that deserve the attention are, should be getting it. And I'm like Bob and a lot of, there are several good professionals out there. And there's, there's several good beekeepers out there who are running 50 hives and 30 hives that are doing the right thing. So we've got to focus on those people. Cayman, do you have any favorite comedians? Uh, I really like Mark Lowry. He's he's pretty funny. You know, my biggest complaint with most comedians is they can't be funny anymore without being really vulgar and nasty. And I don't get that um, because a lot of the, the older comedians, um, you know, from the 50s and 60s that I, I like to listen to um, weren't vulgar and still were really funny. But I guess, you know, it's 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 easier to get people who are, you know, okay with that humor and that it might be drunk to get them to laugh as opposed to someone who's sober and yet to have really good content to make them laugh. I don't know. That's just I, I can't think of any comedians that are really going right now that really just I like to follow. It's all old stuff. Yeah, Jonathan Bennett, it's it's really, really fun. I, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. Yeah, shoot, if Paul is on the roster, well, maybe maybe Paul um, Kelly will let you fly down with him, Ian. Um, honestly, that would that would be cool. Um, how far is the University of Guelph um, from you, Ian? Is it, is it a pretty good flight or a pretty good drive or whatever it is? Hey, Cayman, have you heard of the seldom seen? Oh, yeah. I, I know of the seldom seen, uh, seen all, all that group. Um, I know they had a song called um, I Know You, Writer, Gonna Miss Me When I'm Gone or something like that. Or just I think they just said writer. And uh, that was one that was, they did a lot of songs. Hey, JB, um, I, I doubt that. Um, on the you know, oxalic acid causing more damage than it's it's helping. That hasn't been my experience over the last several years. Um, I, and a lot of guys that I respect that are running lots of colonies also find it to be very useful. There's a lot more that can cause a colony to, to collapse besides Varroa. Could be your neighbor didn't have um, enough nutrition in the hive. Um, there, there's so many variables, and really the only good answer is to you know, do checks and stuff and see what's going on.
Mm, so I'm planning to move from sheep to bees entirely. Well, that sounds like a good choice right there. Um, I'm just not a sheep and a, a goat person. Um, they, they're they always getting out of the fence. Maybe sheep aren't as bad, but goats are really bad. And I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not into that kind of thing. But would 100 hives be a good starter number for a commercial income with a goal of 300 within three years? Yeah, I mean, just, just be careful how you grow. I mean, just don't go too fast. Um, but I mean, if you can do 100 hives really good, and you manage them really at a high level, then yeah, you can go to 300 pretty quickly. But you definitely don't need to overdo it. And like Ian says, put your money into equipment that can be resold, as opposed to, you know, you know bees, you can lose your shirt, you can lose all your uh, the majority of your colonies in a year in the wrong conditions. But 100, you can make a good bit of money with 100 hives if you manage them at a high level. Beekeepers, and I'm raising my hand here because I've been bad about this over the years, um, are bad about overshooting their headlights, and they can't manage things at 100%. <clears throat> about time for some honey. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to actually getting to, to sit down and talk with Aaron Burns, who's another Tennessee beekeeper at the TBA conference. For those of you who are in the Tennessee region, the Tennessee Beekeepers Association Conference, I will be speaking there. And I think it's 40 or $60 for the two-day conference. It's um, very affordable. Um, and I, I will be one of the speakers there this year. And so if you're a Tennessean, I, I definitely urge you to come to that because we're trying to make some changes here in Tennessee and make things better. And I, if we need all the people we can get to change a lot of the old ways of doing things here in Tennessee that really need to go away. But that's going to be a lot of fun. I'll actually be in some ways more fun than my conference because I won't be um, running the darn thing. Um, I will actually be able to sit around and shoot the bowl and go out to dinner and not having to be wanting to throttle people who aren't doing their jobs. Hey, Americans B. And by the way, if um, you have a club or association that's uh, interested in, in me speaking, um, I probably I only have a handful of dates open for the rest of 2022. So if, if you're looking into that or thinking about that, need to get that done because I have been really surprised how many clubs are getting back to, to holding. Well, I'm not surprised that they're holding something. I'm surprised they're asking me, I guess, um, to come out and speak. So my schedule is really booked up. Huh, the board will pull me in as director, fat chance, and there's no, no way I'm getting involved with them. Um, running the Tennessee Beekeepers Association. Help from the side is it. And that's only if the administration that's in office is um, doing the right things. Drop them faster than, well, I'm not going to say it. HopGuard, I don't think it's a Man Lake product, Hat Beakers. I, I don't think so, but maybe they, maybe they do. I, I don't know. I didn't think it was, but maybe it is. If that's the case, I've been dogging their product for years. I, and HopGuard stinks. So do you have a paraffin wax box dipping recipe? Yes, that's 50% paraffin and 50% microcrystalline. Just equal parts. 250 degrees minimum. Be, um, I like to run it around 270 and dip it for 15 minutes. And that's and the boxes that we're going to be selling um, by if you're coming to the TBA conference or you want to pick up there Thursday, Friday, March 4th and 5th and the night before the 4th, um, I will be delivering some wax dip boxes pre order only, though. I won't have any to sell there. Have you ever thought of doing almond pollination? I totally have. And I just don't think that I, I'm going to end up doing that. There's other ways to do um, stuff in beekeeping. And honey, nucleus colonies, and um, you know, part of me would like to do that. I've thought about maybe one day just um, getting one of my buddies that goes to the almonds and just helping them take them out there and just experiencing that. And I think that'd be great, but it's just not something that I think that um, I'm going to end up doing. How do you heat the wax for box dipping? Um, I've got I've got several videos on it, Jeremy. Um, I, I I do, and several other people do. It's really just um, a simple tank with a 
propane burner underneath. Nothing, nothing fancy at all. I can think of plenty of people who need to be throttled. Yeah. So Laurel just posted down below a link to an order form. These will have to be picked up. They're not shipped, but if you want wax dip boxes, they are Cypress boxes, deeps and mediums available. Um, we'll probably end up doing around three to 400 before spring. Don't have a lot of time for this kind of work. Um, and you can get some boxes um, that are assembled and ready to go. They are glued as well. Yeah, no, no almond pollination for me, though. I was really shocked, though. I'm actually going to start treating for some small hive beetles here in the next week. We've just had a really bad infestation of small hive beetles last year. Uh, they just they did a lot better. And I have some colonies that still have like 50 to 100 small hive beetles in them in February. And so I want to kill them before they get a chance to reproduce. So I'm going to try. I've never tried to kill small hive beetles in February. So I think I'm going to do that and see if I can't kill a bunch of them before they have um, really the availability to get out and fly out of the hives and move around the bee yard. Someone asked if I'm going to sell nukes this year. Um, I, I have some to sell, but I'm not going to sell as many this year as I have in the past. You know, probably just a couple hundred, and most of those will be sold to bee clubs. And it just makes it a lot easier to sell 50 at a time as opposed to one or two at a time. If I do sell any to uh, smaller groups, I will post something on Facebook or here on that. Ooh, Thomas, 54 degrees to 25 in three hours. That is a pretty big drop in temperature. Yeah, Lawson's Creek Apiary. And that's what's so interesting about the oxalic acid situation. You have Randy Ox um, doing tests over here saying this. Um, you have a university over here saying, no, that doesn't work. Um, you have a beekeeper over here saying, this is working for me. Um, you have another beekeeper saying that it's not working for them. That's why we've just, I think beekeepers have just got to get more involved. We've, we've got in, we've got to get to the, the bottom of these things. And oh, by the way, if anybody knows of a researcher in Europe or someone that has done research on oxalic acid or treatments that would be helpful, that information being brought onto the, our YouTube channel, um, I, I like to interview them. Um, one of the caveats is they have to speak English, and that helps quite a bit. And if we can get someone, though, from over there that's maybe an, really good with oxalic acid, whether it's a beekeeper or whether it's a researcher, it'll be interesting to have somebody from overseas, Italy, um, any of those countries over there, and just talk with them about what they're seeing in their countries and just see if we can start drawing some insight from countries that have been able to use it for longer than we have. That'd be fun. Vanderpool Farms, Dr. Ramesh, I think I'm saying that right. Ramesh, maybe that's right. Um, Sagili, and I can't ever get those. Oregon State University. All right. I have to keep that one in mind. Always. One thing I want to say, and I said this earlier, is some people are seeing Cameron Jack's information on how weak oxalic acid and they're like, oh my goodness, should we even use this anymore? And don't buy into the knee-jerk reactions. I feel as a culture that we're we're bad about that. I think we've I think we've almost been programmed to be like that. And whether that what's going on politically or what's going on racially, we're not going to get involved in all this deep stuff. But I'm just saying, our it's it's planned that we have a society of knee-jerk reactions. Heaven forbid the government have a country that actually sit down and think things through rationally. Because if everybody did, whether they were black or white, male or female, or whether they believed in God or were an atheist or believed in the coronavirus or didn't, they would all sit down and realize the problem with 90% of the things we face in this country is the government. <laughs> and I might get censored now. Oh, my goodness. But actually, a lot of us are more alike than we, we realize. But heaven forbid... Um, we actually get along. Ooh, 
Ooh, it is getting hot in this room. It's all the hot air, uh, all the hot air. Hmm. What methods will you use for hive beetles? So I have some traps that are similar to the beetle blasters, but they're reusable. And I'm going to be using those in the video that I'll be using. And I also have a bunch of the Dynamax. I'm going to type that down below. It's made by Brawny. And the bees will fluff it up and the the bees will fluff it up and the beetles will get their legs caught into it and they will just die over time being caught in the Dynamax towels by Brawny. <laughs> Rest in peace, Kate, Cayman's Canadian bank account. I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, but ah, uh, So Jerry Brown asked a question. What's on the dry erase board behind me? What, what did he say in the Wizard of Oz? Pay no attention to what's there's behind the curtain or whatever it is. Um, now, that's one of my favorite films. I like a, I like the Wizard of Oz. Call me a weirdo. Um, you'd probably be right. So there's a, that's just some of the information. I've also got a, a board behind me I haven't put up yet. But this is stuff related to the future conference. And you, you might be able to see some names up there. That doesn't mean that they're coming. Um, Ian's right up there at the top. That doesn't mean that he's coming. <laughs> we're going to, no, we're planning on having Ian for sure. Um, it's just, um, it's a lot of names um, of people we're looking into. And some of them have already told me no. And some of them have already told me yes. So it's the speaker lineup for this coming year is going to just blow away last year's speaker lineup. It's just going to destroy it. Ah, Ian will be all right. He's a, he's a big boy and he can take it. And you know, if he can't, he can. There's plenty of show outside, snow outside the shovel. That's a lot. Those were some big snow drifts, Ian. I mean, that, those snow drifts looked like six foot tall. Or were they were they taller than that? Ronald says, "Have you had any problems using more than one gram of oxalic acid in a vaporizer, like four or more grams?" I haven't. I have never actually treated four grams in one shot that I know of. I have used three grams in one shot before. Vaporizer handled it just fine. And the bees handled it fine. You know what I found? The more that I have kept the mites low, even if it takes a lot of treatments with oxalic acid vapor, the better my bees do. I have never once seen any damage with oxalic acid vapor to the queen, to the bees. If it is, it's minimal and is nothing compared to what Varroa does to them the viruses that they vector. Well, I think that's why a lot of people have fun at um, our, our conference, guys is, and gals, is because we come to talk about bees. And by and large, the people that come, I didn't, I didn't see any issues. They're just good people. And maybe it's just, and part of it may be the area that I live in, but I, I'm a people person. I talk to a lot of people that I've never known in the past. I go up to a complete stranger and strike up a conversation. And this is something that I truly believe is if you run into a halfway decent person and you treat them nice, they'll treat you nice most of the time. And if you treat someone who's a bad person and you treat them nice, well, they'll treat you to their best, which still won't be good, but it won't be their worst. So a lot of, you know, a lot of it depends on us. Uh, let's not let's not get too deep down that rabbit hole because then I'm going to start talking like Jordan Peterson, which um, sorry Ian is is one of my favorite Canadians. Could be my favorite. There's a gentleman who's working on OA tablets, and I think we can get four to six of those one gram tablets in our caps. Yeah, I've actually been talking to him back and forth, Rob, and. Um, I'm hoping those work. Maybe it takes longer to treat, but some things are worth it. Yeah, Stevens B Co. Um, I've not heard of that Warren's um life, and maybe I have, and I just I've forgotten. There's just so many YouTube channels out there now. 
adventurous life. Came if you ever thought about running for office. Actually, I have. Um, not anytime soon. We got to figure out the B stuff first. But I, I do believe that, you know, if, if good people want things to get better, then the good people have to get involved. That's why I, I'm urging Tennesseans to get involved at the TBA conference this year. If you haven't come in the past, I think now's the best time in my beekeeping lifetime to get involved with our Tennessee Beekeepers Association. Totally different leadership change and different outlook and trying to make positive changes. And it's just like this conference. It's just like this YouTube channel. This is only possible because of everybody working together and being able to do this. Some people, and I get the credit. Everyone's like Cayman Reynolds, Cayman Reynolds. But really without all the support that we have gotten in the community of people, this would not exist. It would not. And there's been so many great things. And it's not just my YouTube channel or the, the conference that have been built from it. There are so many other businesses that we've been able to help get off the ground that are good businesses. There's been things that we have been able to make aware through this. It's a community. And we are collectively able to do a heck of a lot more than I could have ever done by myself and what you could have done by yourself. So I'm, I'm looking forward to more contributions from more people because it's really what makes us. Oh, Stevens B. Co. is Corey Stevens. Ah, okay. Yeah, Corey. I was wondering if that might have been Corey. Yeah, well, I've talked to Corey a few times. He actually was at our conference and we got him up um, during the one of the round tables. And, you know, he said his opinion. Bob said his and um, Dr. David said his opinion. And I said, well, doggone. Um, no, uh, it, it was good. I like Corey as a person and I want to believe him. I have a hard time believing him with my past experiences with treatment free bees. I, I, I am the literal doubting Thomas until I see the holes from the nails in Jesus's hands on this proverbial, proverbially speaking, I am not going to believe it. Am I hopeful? I hope that Corey is 100% right and he's got bees that actually work, but let's be realistic here. So far, we're 30 something years or more, no, more in, into this Varroa problem, and it's still an issue. If someone had a bee that was just this easy to control Varroa, it would have spread around. Beekeepers tried things, commercial beekeepers tried things. But if we can find a bee that even helps re remove Varroa at 25% more than what we experience now, it would be massively a big deal. It would be massive. So we need to look into that, and I'm going to be looking into that. In the future experimental yards, we'll be looking into that more. But there's a lot of, and I'm not saying this is Corey, but this is treatment-free in general. There's a lot of, of horse nuggets to shovel through to get to the real information. But I am, Corey is a great guy. I'm looking forward to working with him in the future. But you're right. He's got some good information. I hope that he is onto something. Mm -hmm. Good deal, Rob. Let me know how those work out for you, please. Who going to be in the 70s all next week in Lower Alabama? Seeing lots of people post pictures of swarm boxes. Hey, if you're in Lower Alabama, yeah, better get the swarm boxes up. <laughs> so I want to kind of just real quick reiterate on these patties yet again. So a lot of people have asked me about storage of these patties. This is Michael Palmer's original recipe. I took it and tweaked it because it needed a little bit of tweaking um, due to the, some of the changes in the Ultra B, re Ultra B recipe. And when I last talked to Michael Palmer, um, he said that it needed to be tweaked because it just it was runnier than it used to be. And it's something that Ultra B has done. Um, and th these are darker, a lot darker than they used to be. This looks to me more like B Pro, their lower grade pollen sub, than it does Ultra B. Ultra B was a little bit more orangish looking. So we we changed the, the ratios just a little bit, not much. And then mainly we added gelatin to it and just switched the, the Ultra B and the sugar content in relation to the water content just adjusted that a little bit. People have been asking about storage. 
This has been kept in the fridge since before the video is one of the first batches. And that texture right there is just perfect. It's malleable, it's soft, and it works really good. And it's under a dollar a pound if you can get it for the, the same prices that I can. I bet that you probably can. So, or get it really close if you're in this region of the country. So this is a, a great way to feed it. You don't have to have inverted syrup. I've got some in the, I'll be storing these in the fridge for probably two months and seeing if there's any separation or if it's starting to mold or smell. And I'll let you guys know how that works for me. And then I'm also got, I got some in the freezer and I'm going to keep them in there for a while. And then I'm going to um, yank them out and see if there's any separation during thaw. And right now I have some of these pollen patties, even though I don't typically use this recipe. Actually, I don't use this recipe. I use a inver inverted syrup recipe. I will, I'm using this on colonies to test and see how long they sit, stay soft and last. And so far, I think we're six days in, they are still soft and the bees are eating them really good. So I'm excited by that. The main thing with the other recipe is it dry out some. So, so far, so good. We'll keep you updated on that. Trying to find affordable options for pollen patties in Tennessee. It's about time to start feeding them if you um, are going to. Have you ever made pollen patties with honey? Yes, I absolutely have. So we have a recipe for syrup, but if you literally take honey and exchange it, the syrup with the honey, it will work just fine. Um, no, I don't buy pollen to put in my feeding patties because um, a lot of the, the pollen that we get comes from Asia. Um, not all of it. Um, but I just wonder sometimes what could be in there. They also irradiate it. And so I don't, just because there's pollen in there doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. Actually, a lot of pollen in trials has not performed any better than subs. And I wonder, and I've talked to a couple guys like Ian about this, and Ian wonders as well, you know, what what is so special about fresh pollen coming in? When you store it and feed it back, it doesn't do as good. So I don't, I just don't want to risk any um, disease. I don't want to fool with it. Now, the only time I do feed pollen back, and I have done this frequently, is when we're raising queens. I have pollen traps from Apame. It's a great pollen trap and easy to use, and it's easy to clean. That's one of the reasons I like it. And I will save pollen that I gather, and I will make pollen patties with honey and pollen for queen rearing, because I do feel like it's better, and it's our pollen, so I know it's clean. It's nothing's as good as fresh pollen, in my opinion. And I, I think that's a pretty universally um, accepted. Sixties in Missouri. Yeah, it'll be about sixty degrees to here tomorrow as well, Fahrenheit. Aren't Asian bees varroa resistant? Oh, so the Asian honeybee is varroa resistant. The you know, if they're using a European bee over there for honey production and pollination, then no, they're not. Um, the Asian honeybee is quite a bit different. Smaller colonies, that helps reduce varroa populations. And this is the most important. Varroa cannot reproduce on female bees or female brood in those Asian honeybee colonies. That's massive. If, if it was that way for us, varroa would be so easy but they can reproduce on our females. And that's why early in the spring, if your colony's building up in an early summer, you don't see a big difference. But once bees stop raising drones to a large extent, then that pressure jumps onto the nurse bees and the, the females. And that's, that's a problem. Because if your worker bees are clean and don't have viruses in them, then as they're feeding the next generation, they're not um, getting a, um, you know, a dose of virus every time you know, they're getting fed. And once you get that direct transmission of virus from the nurse bees to the larvae, it's just your, your colonies are just toast. But yeah, the Asian honeybee is very different. And if they do get into any worker cells and try to reproduce, the Asian honeybee larvae and pupae will die. And so it's never able to actually make a reproductive cycle, only on the drones. And they were just raised drones for a short period of, of the year. So unfortunately, the Asian honeybee and our bee is very different. And the wild bees that do survive here to a degree, 
to what little extent that we know. They swarm a lot. They keep small colonies and they're not very good honey producers, just like the Asian honeybee. So it seems like if beekeepers want to have bees and are okay with really low honey yields and okay with splitting a lot, then yes, they can do that. And I think that's one of the things that treatment-free beekeepers use to be sustainable to a degree. However, the issue is if they sell bees to somebody, they could have a decent bit of mites because selling bees off is a great way to reduce mites in your bee yard. And two, if that beekeeper that buys them then treats them like a honey production colony where they're trying to get a nice big honey yield, keep the colonies big and is not breaking that mite cycle and is or not letting them swarm a bunch, then now you're changing the dynamics that made it work in the first place. It's a complicated issue. But we've got to get to the bottom of it. It's a challenge, and I believe we are making some progress. So I'm, I'm not giving up, and I'm hoping to be around if Laura will keep me around for another 50 years or so. So uh, that's you, you know what I'm going to be working on. There we go. Find a way to breed towards 20-day worker brood. Hey, there you go. Hey, Yvonne. Um, hope you're doing good in Kentucky. I made a Kentucky joke earlier. Um, I guess you, you you weren't here to hear that one. It was it was comedy gold. Please explain. Is it okay to boil three to one sugar water mixture for a minute to create a syrup similar to honey thickness for winter bees? I saw your video on inversion. Now, Chad, this has been monstrously controversial for me. There are people who literally think that if you boil water and just dump sugar and then mix it just to make a one to one or even a two to one, that you are creating so much HMF that is not true. There is a lot that we don't know. What I do know is that I have made that invert syrup before and it has worked and it has worked and it has worked and I have not noticed any bees dying at any time. Is there a small bit of HMF in there? Possibly. In the research that I've seen on HMF, it's usually very high heat for a little bit of an extended period, or it is a decent bit of heat over a long period of time. And we're not trying to caramelize this. We're not trying to make a dark amber syrup or anything like that. That's something that um, you know really is open for debate right now. However, I haven't had issues with it. But if your reason is to make invert syrup for patties and you're concerned with that mix, I'm personally not concerned. But if you want to save your time, these, whoops, these sugar based patties do a really good job and they're affordable. So and you don't have to do all that work. So um, if you've watched that video on this this recipe, then um, I think that might be a, a way to go where you don't have to even think about the HMS. But personally, I, I think the HMFs are a little bit overblown. I've yet I only know like one or two instances where someone's maybe had bees die from HMF related causes um, in this region. So take it take that for what it's worth. I have plenty of opinions. Doesn't mean I have answers. Yeah, I'm using 18 gauge staples right now. Um, it's better to have a thicker staple for boxes. Uh, however, um, if you glue them and staple the heck out of them with 18 gauge, it, they work really good still. The glue is the main thing. How do I know when a honey flow is getting started and what is the first thing that needs to be done? Well, when the bees are, you know, over time, you get used to seeing what a honey flow looks like, and you can see the bees kind of flying in slow, and they're they're really laden. If the light's behind them, they're very translucent. Bees are really busy, and honestly, um, if you if there's a good honey flow, then you know, they're typically a lot more gentle. But you get inside the main way is to get inside the hive and see if they're storing nectar and mainly draw, drawing out wax. If they are, is a nectar flow is going on, you need to make sure the queen has plenty of room to lay. And they have plenty of room to store that nectar because if they backfill and that queen runs out of room to lay, they will swarm. So the main thing is, is be concerned about swarming during that time. 
Hey, Cayman, what's your thoughts on bee weaver bees claiming 100% of bee weaver's hives have been chemical free since 2001? I don't know 100% what to think about that. Um, part, I know what I want to say about it. Opinions are like noses. Everyone's got one. Their bees are really expensive. There's a lot of rumors, and there is a video out there on bee weavers that, and if, I, if that was my video, I would be embarrassed out of my mind to have even posted it. It does not look like they know what they're doing. I know people who have personally sold bees to bee weavers for them to shake into packages. Now, they say they, their excuse is, well, it's our queens, and we just need more bees to be able to make sales. Uh, of sales of packages, but they're very expensive. I know people who have owned them. I've owned one. I was given a hive of bee weavers and they were the meanest bees I've ever had. Some people say bee weavers are very gentle. Some people say they're thrifty. Some people say that mites built up in them. And some people say they're the easiest, most treatment-free bees in the world. So everyone's got an opinion on them. I think you can sell a lot of bees and, um, and say you're treatment free and who, how is anyone going to prove otherwise that's that's the condition that we're in right now there's so much demand right now for bees that even if you were telling a lie and 100 people said man these did not work at all mites build up all that stuff it's no big deal to the company because there's still so many new people people that need bees the next year and getting into it you'll just sell to the next people there's there's always someone else to sell to until we get the conditions of the market where there's too many good quality queens and there's too good, too many quality bees, the pressure on the poor companies won't be there. I'm not saying Bee Weavers is a poor company, but right now it's just an open market. And even people who are selling garbage are still selling out and can't keep up with demand. So that's the condition of the market. Not saying that's the way Bee Weavers are. I don't think that they're that good. I had a buddy of mine requeened his entire operation with Bee Weavers and hated it one because he couldn't work his bees within get within 200 yards of his hives um i've got some great photos of him too him and his son just had both of their eyes swole shut and some interesting interesting stuff but yeah so you know that's my opinion have i tried hundreds of their queens nope i, I know a lot of people who have and they have not found that to be the case yeah and they're they're extremely expensive too it's funny how a lot of people who are trying to save the bees um, with their special genetics and their new ways are some of the most expensive to buy from and yet have zero accountability. Huh. <sighs> Yeah, you know, and I'm hoping that I'm wrong on some of these things. And like, again, with Corey Stevens, it's complicated. But I remember buying these special bees that bit Varroa and were supposed to take care of them. This strain of VSH, this strain of VSH, the SMR bees, the USDA Russian program bees, um, bee weavers, this or that, these hygienic bees. And you know what? We're still in this mess. And then what bothers me is I've tried all this stuff out and then people look at me incredulously like, how could you not be treatment free? How could you not be advocating for that? I used to advocate for that back when I just blindly believed it and I wanted to push it because I wanted it to be real more than I actually knew it was real. So it, it's complicated. And I want you all to be successful. My, my hope is that most beekeepers that watch my channel will see me pointing to other beekeepers and pointing to what we do as this is fundamental beekeeping. You can keep your bees alive with great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition. You can be successful. And hey, we've kept our bees alive now. We've learned how to do that. We've produced some honey. So now we're not just forking out tons of dollars every year. Maybe we're just breaking even, but that's a heck of a lot better than dropping three grand and losing that every year. And getting to that point of having some success and hey, and then if you want to go from there and venture into the harder stuff, knock yourselves out. But I feel like we've lost so many beekeepers that would have stuck with it had we not taught them treatment free out of the gate.
All magic queens we have bought have been a disaster. Yeah. Well, there's there's some guys up there in uh, Oregon, I think, that are doing some of that stuff, too, um, Vanderpool. It's uh, it's really frustrating. And I think what's the most frustrating part about it is the fact that there are some men and women who are actually doing the hard work trying to create a super bee and trying to better the situation. And they're being drowned out and not getting the support they need because of all the con artists. And you can break even. Um, there are there's a guy I know here not too far from me. Um, I think he's about 20 miles. Raises 20 to 30 hives a year. He sells um, a, a handful of nukes, maybe a dozen a year. Produces honey. Um, he he paints his equipment really good, and in, and he makes sure it doesn't rot, so he gets the most longevity out of his equipment he can. And he's very sustainable, keeps his bees alive from year to year. Sometimes he raises his queens. Sometimes he makes his splits with queens that he purchases. But he manages his mites, keeps his bees healthy and fed, and runs a small operation. And he actually does more than breaks even. On a bad year, he'll break even. On a good year, he's made a few thousand extra dollars on the side. And he enjoys it. It's not about a business for him. Um, he just he just doesn't want it to be something where, his, you know, his spouse is like, you know, babe, you've dropped another four thousand dollars. And I, I've played that game before. I think that's part of the process of getting to that point. But you can do it. And I think a lot of it is not getting in over our heads and trying to go for 50 colonies when we probably should keep it at 15 to 20. I wish Brother Adam was um, still alive. Uh, I think Brother Adam would be um, an interesting person to see what he would be doing with this Varroa si uh, situation. Varroa is a lot more complicated than tracheomites, though. Of course, of a different color. Good feedback, Dan. And... Um, that, that definitely, um, you know, sounds reasonable. And that, that's what I want to find out. Are there bees that are gentle to work with, productive, and can buy us some time? I think that realistically at this point, that would, that would be a huge win. If we could find a bee that consistently could give us two more months out of the year of a gap between treatments and just, or just had to treat a little bit less, or if maybe we treat the same amount, but it's just easier to keep Varroa under control because our bees are keeping them a little reduced, that would be awesome. What's the best suggestion for next year's conference that you hadn't thought of? Ooh. Well, I don't know. I'll have to sit down and think of that one. I've had some speaker recommendations. A lot of them I've already heard of. Some of them I'm still looking into. Um, I can't really think of that one. One of the things that I'm going to try to do is have more help so I actually can be involved a little bit more um, as far as being able to meet people. I guess the best suggestion, yeah, I think this would probably fit, is maybe looking into opening up a little bit on Thursday night. We're looking into that. That's an added expense just to have the room for half of an evening. Plus, we have to get everything prepped that morning, which would be insane. But if we can get that done, it'll be about another four thousand dollars for one room but then we can have an opening night we'll have to charge a little bit more to cover the room um, for the people who show up for thursday but we could have a meet and greet um little dealio where it could just be um getting to meet the speakers taking pictures with the speakers getting a little bit jump on getting to see the vendors um so you have a little bit more time to talk to the vendors it's just basically a time period to network and get pictures and autographs if you want you know bob benny's autographed or you know a, a picture with ian so you can use that to ward off uh, pests in the hive or something i mean that might work for varroa control i don't know we haven't tried that one yet it probably has better chance of working than some of these things i see on the internet sounds like bee weaver has just a little bit of everything in those uh those bees What are the most oh, gentle bees for a southern climate like Florida? I don't, I don't know. 
Yeah, just grow, just grow some mushrooms at the bottom of, of the beehive. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, though. Every time, this, this, this frustrates the heck out of me. Every time we hear something new that's going to help save the bees, a lot of times it, it goes viral, everyone shares it, and then nothing comes out of it. And I think that just goes to show you how complicated it is. And how expensive it is too, but it has to work. Oh, I'm getting messages. It might be Laurel telling me. Uh oh. Yeah, someone's commenting in the family. Mm -mm. I might be in trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Have you heard that mites don't like certain flowers? Ah, you know, most of the mites don't get hauled out to outside, though. They don't get taken on trips. There are some bees that do ride on foragers. It, it is a fact, but the bulk majority of, of them do not. They want to stay and feed on the, the nurse bees, and they want to feed on the brood. So even if there are some flowers that could impact that a little bit, I, I think it would be really, really minimal. But, you know, a lot of stuff that I hear about those kind of things, it's just really sketchy. And that's a problem. A lot of these things are real sketchy. I mean, just we're, we, we need something that's going to work. Hey, Jose, hope you guys are doing out there and good in California. Hope the almonds are doing good. I've heard some, of course, the almonds have span over such a massive area. I've heard some people say that the bees are getting fat on the, um, the flow. And some guys are saying they're not getting anything in their hives. So uh, who knows? Hope, hope your bees are looking fat and sassy, but not a little too fat. Yeah, yeah. Ian hits me with some jokes. Uh, yeah, he, he does all right. The more he hangs around me, probably the worse he'll get. Would time plants in the bee yard do nothing at all? Well, is there any of the, the thyme essential oil and the nectar. You know, I don't know. I mean, has anyone tested the nectar? That, that would be some interesting research. And yeah, John Hatch, you're right. Mites, it has been proven that mites do not um, have any resistance build up at all to tannerite. Neither does the uh, the box that the, the mites and the bees are in. But, um, you know, if we could just f find a way to make a small little detonation. So, Oh, it'll work. I do like Apigard. And between that and Formic um, Pro, I would go Apigard right now. That's primarily because I've used Apigard more, so I'm comfortable with it. Um, thanks, Thomas Stone, for what, what you said. Um, but the Formic is really sensitive on the temperatures. And when I want to treat my biggest two treatments, in June and around early September or late August, depending on the mite loads. And Formic can't handle those hot temperatures, those hot, humid temperatures. So I'm, I'm looking into in the test yard this year, after this year's results, getting Formic Pro more involved in my treatment strategy, but I'm going to have to use it early in spring or late in fall. And it can't be so late in fall that the mites have already done their damage. So I've got to have something to keep them under control throughout the summer. Well, pollen's good. Pollen's good, Jose. You can always feed syrup. Um, it's hard to duplicate pollen. Yeah, you know, we're looking into it. Um, the trick is, you know, it's it's when we start looking into having a whole another day of the conference, and we're looking at that. I know some conferences go three or four days, but then we start talking, you know, prices on everything and how much that impacts um, the cost of the ticket and the cost of labor, um, you know, how much uh, keep the speakers for another day of rooms. It's, there's, it's, it's complicated, but we are doing the work and we are looking into, I think the best bet right now for an extension on the Hive Life Conference is to have something I'm small on Thursday night and see how that goes. 
And long term, who knows, maybe we turn it into a three day event, but to a degree, less is more. And I really felt like what we had th this last year was good. We just need to critique it and make it better. And since we'll have double the speakers and it'll be in a bigger area, we'll have the entire building rented, which is very expensive. And I'm going to have a, just a lot more things going on. So it, it, it'll be better this year. And we appreciate it. By the way, hivelifeconference.com. If you've been to our conference, definitely fill out the survey. If you haven't been to our conference, just say that you haven't in the survey and let us know what you have liked at other conferences, or what you would like to see, who would you like to hear, topics, all that stuff. We are reading those and we are trying to make it the best that we can. Yeah, we'll just, we, if we do Thursday, we'll have to charge a little bit extra um, just to mainly cover the room and any expenses that we have. That's the main thing is just covering the expenses. Hmm. Yeah, have Laurel do a personal uh, or ha have a public service announcement. Yeah, on YouTube and sell tickets. You'll be sold out in an hour. You're right. I mean, if we could get Laurel to do a video, she, we'd probably have our first viral video or something too. But, you know, it's just... Uh, it's hard to get her to get on the videos. That's all right. I prefer my life um, over, you know. It's all, yeah, it's, it's all jokes, all jokes, bad jokes. Like Ian says, bad jokes. So I think, Jose, the Hive Life Conference uh, ticket sales are actually going to be really early this year. They're going to be. I'm, I'm shooting for June, late June, early July at the latest. And this year, on we're going to have the website really decked out nice. So there's going to be links to the deals on the website. We'll, we'll still have the Facebook group, which is great. That really helped us out this year. And it was awesome to see all the community posts and people um, of what they did at the conference. That was awesome. But have a centralized Hive Life Conference um, website. And use hivelifeconference.com and you can go, oh, look over here at Premier Foundation. This is their discount. Here's the link to go get their discount. And here's how you pre-order. So we're going to try to have the pre-orders much more streamlined. And the, the, the companies did phenomenal at our conference this year. They had a, a great time and sold um, plenty of product. So it's encouraging. For one, they'll come back. One, other companies are going to come. And that gives us some more opportunities to continue the deals and create new deals. There's definitely going to be some cool new deals in the works this year. So we're going to do everything we can. And, you know, you guys contributing, talking to that survey, what are some companies? What are some deals? Trying to get Sarah Cell there this year, trying to get some Swarm Commander, uh, trying to get some Maxent stuff, trying, just trying to get a lot of different things. And thankfully, like Jed Thorne, who came this year, He's going to have a whole line of USA made stuff. I've been seeing some of the pictures that he sent me from Wisconsin and he came this year with his prototype and we are going to have a, a nice American made quality extractor that um, I think is going to give some of the other companies a run for their money as far as uh, American companies. Yeah, Laurel's had to uh, deal with the spam. Some of the companies did some giveaways. The silent auction was a big success. Let me talk about that for just a second because we raised enough right now for the kids sponsorships, which I'll be announcing at like around the same time in summer as far as who the winners are. I'm going to try to actually get that out in spring so kids can prep for that. But right now we have enough to, if we're taking care of the Guardians ticket, their food, the kids ticket and the food, and the and their hotel room. That's what the plan is, hotel room and the ticket. So it's not just the tickets. So that's a pretty sweet deal for the kid. And you know, if they're able to bring themselves, and that's fantastic. We want to burn quite so much money um, if they're 20 years old. But right now we have enough to do 13 kids with hotels and a Guardian. So that's awesome. Full rides. Obviously, they have to get themselves there. But so if you know a young kid who's involved in bees and really seriously and would like to come, 
Um, those will be available in the future. I'm hoping to get uh, more um, of those available, and I'm pretty sure I will be able to like to get into the 20s at least this year on full rides. All right, Pierce Beekeeping's coming back. I, I appreciate you coming all the way from California, Anura. Um, by the way, Pierce Beekeeping, all of their tools have been made in the USA since 1940s, uh, 47, 43, one of those 40s. The new bee journal, we're working with Laura Bees Consulting with the University of Florida, Dr. Ellis, a chemical engineer, about the temperature ranges for proper sublimation formic acid as a byproduct. That's awesome. Um, keep me in the loop on that. I'm always interested in learning things. Jeremy, have a great night. Yeah, the silent auction went really good. The Thursday beer tickets. I... I don't know about that. Um, actually, I, I know about that. That's not that's not going to be happening. If you want the beer, can be outside the room illegally. Well, legally, I think it can be done, but the, the the place will not allow us to have alcohol inside. Even if we wanted to do meat, I'm not sure how that would go. I'm going to have to look into that this year. All right. All right. Yeah, the eco wood. I don't know about that. Um, we're we're seeing. You know, I've tried it out on a couple hives. It's going to take a while to be able to see how long it actually holds up. Wants to see ZZ top at the next conference. We will see about fitting that into our budget. Swarm season starts in my area here in about two, two to three weeks at the earliest end of it. Typically, it hits harder towards the end of March and definitely April. Oh, yeah, it's totally worth it. All right. Looking forward to seeing you again um, at the conference. Already already prepped again. That's um, January 6th and 7th. And some people are a little concerned at how much it's going to grow. I do think it's going to be around 1,200 people, maybe more. But it's going to be over the entire building, which is not quite triple the size of what we had this year but it's going to be a massive area and i'm going to have more than double the speakers and we're and that's where i'm thinking we might do that thursday and try to extend it and, and a lot depends if the more people come the more we're going to be able to do the problem is and this is what i was talking to laurel about the other day and one of our conference supervisors is that there's a kind of a gap and to go from just having the one room to having the next room and then the next room and then paying for another recording system over there and speakers and all of the things that we have to have in those other rooms and then getting more than double the speakers more flights more people helping me it's just more of everything we're talking Forty thousand dollars easily on the i'm sure that's on the low end so if we go from having like 900 people this year to a thousand you know that's that's it's going to be hard to swing we'll actually probably lose money on on growing but if we can go to 12 or 1500 then that's where actually we can pay that and then put have money left over to put into some of the nicer things which is a fancier honey show, more staff. It's, there's just a lot to it. And it, everything's expensive. But we are we are being as creative as we can. A lot of you saw how creative we were this year in trying to innovate. I, I'm not trying to toot our own horn, but I think we did a pretty darn good job for less than uh, a year and six months into conferencing. So um, we are not going to give up now, and we are going to keep working hard. And Jason... Um, I, I want to say thanks for your donation. I've been meaning to get to that. And I almost forgot. We appreciate you supporting what we're doing. All right. Jose says he's going to be at the door giving out, uh, doing the tickets. Fantastic. Jose, you're volunteered. Um, no, seriously, I, um, I, I might need some help. <laughs> um, and there, what you can do is also um, push some of your um, California beekeeper hats. You're going to bring some of those with you. 
So um, is there, this person says, is there a video coming out of your experimental yard? I do have some clips that I need to put together. I think what I'm gonna do is put them together with the charts. Uh, for those of you who may have come on late, I'm gonna post this. Oops, um, let me find that one more time. And I'm gonna post this for the last time of the evening. This is the link to the experimental yard information for the oxalic acid test group. This was one treatment per colony, and the colony was made broodless. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, Chad. Um, we'll look into that. All right, Rob, ready to sell more vaporizers next year. Good deal. There, there will not be a, probably a live stream of the conference. I don't think the internet is strong enough um, for that. Um, we're going to look into that, maybe see if there's a higher speed option, but I'm probably not because the thing of it is I've got to get somebody to do that and set that up, and I don't have time to fool with it. And honestly, we're, we're going to probably just record it like we did this year. And we're, we'll have that for sale. We got, we'll have all of those for sale afterwards. Hey, Jimmy Murphy, glad to hear that the videos have helped. And oh, good to hear that your bees are coming out of winter in really good shape. Um, it, it takes a, a, sometimes a little while to dial it in, but the great queen's dead mites and good nutrition really works well. And the more you dial it in, the better results you get. Ooh, yeah, it's about bedtime for me, too. Um, hopefully, the food expense won't go up. Hey, Jimmy Murphy, thanks for the uh, donation. I, I just saw that now. Appreciate that very much. And, um, yeah, so there's, there's just a lot going on. I'm trying to get it all together. Again, I posted that experimental yard information on the oxalic acid test group. It was interesting to see that we only had 54% reduction with the brood break. Some of the colonies were a little higher. Some of them were lower. Now, one thing, I want, if you're looking at the OA test group, I'm, pa I'm pasting that again. So I'm looking at that right now. And one thing I, I find interesting is that um, you know, we, we, let, we let the colonies get a little out of control with the mites. If we're looking at the percentage, like colony six, had a 3.7% infestation rate. That's too high. This uh, colony four had 3%, five had 2%, 3%, 2%, 2%. And 4.94, wow, on, um, on the second colony from the bottom, colony number 12. And so that's a problem. Those are, those are too high. We shouldn't be letting our bees the mites get that high in our bees. And so that's part of the problem right there, I, I firmly believe, is the colonies that had low percentages, um, let's see, here's one that had 0.60% on the initial wash. And then after the treatment, it was below 1%. Ideally, we want under 1% infestation rate. So in an alcohol wash of roughly 300 bees, you would have less than three you had three mites or less one percent of 100 is one so if you have 300 bees in an alcohol wash then that would be three mites anything more than that um it's higher than one percent of course now you can you can bring bees back but the thing of it is it's harder to bring them back because what i'm finding with looking at other people's research and the research that i have done which is not necessarily comparable to everybody else's but I feel like if I could do this every year and I've, I've thought about maybe going and seeing if I could find a week or two or I could work with either maybe Randy Oliver or work with the university um, for a little bit and get some experience on this stuff and get better. I, this is something that I, I really want to work on a little bit in a long term and over time I can get much better. But I, I think that in my experience with treating Varroa in the past, our, our treatments are not getting the 90% kill. The companies will tell you 90%. We've been told for years during a brood break, oxalic acid is 90% kill. 
I don't know if it's 54% like the colonies averaged all together in my test group. You know, Cameron Jacks with the University of Florida seems to think it's lower than that. I seem to think that it's higher than that, but this 54% is not 90% during a brood break, that's for sure. And for those of you who are wondering, you know, you go through and you, you make sure there's no drone brood in there too. And so we, you, know, you go in there and you literally find drone brood and you scratch it open so that there's no drone brood present and you make sure that all the, the varroa mites are exposed. But Apigard, Formic Pro, any of the treatments, I would not count ever on any of your treatments giving you 90% kill throughout the yard. I think that blind trust is the reason that we're in the position that we're in. So focus on keeping your mites low throughout the entire season. And then if you only get a 70% kill, but your mites are already relatively low, say maybe less than 2%, then that 70% is going to be enough to bring them down to below 1%. But if you have 4% infestation, you'll only get 70% drop, though you're still in a bad situation. And within a brood cycle or two, it's going to be almost right back where it was. So it's, it's really about, and then the guys that I know that are really good at this, about keeping their bees alive, selling bees every year, producing honey, all of those things, they control them throughout the season. Gone are the days when you let the mites get really high and then you just crash them back down. Unless we can come up with a new product that just is amazing. But back when we had those products, those you know, the mites became immune to them. And the other side of it was like, I'm talking like apistan and check mite. They just nuke the mites, but they only lasted for a handful of years because they built up and the combs created some toxic, you know, leftovers in the wax and just built up. And then when you cross them, they became even more toxic and created a lot of problems. So it's just, uh, it's, it's such a compl complicated issue. Yeah. So, I mean, sustained control throughout the year. And I know people hate alcohol washes. I know people hate testing. But when you do this, it shows you where you're at, it gives you a, the best ballpark estimate you can have. And over the over time, that's where I, I got to doing three treatments a year. I used to just do one treatment a year. You know what? I kept losing bees. I started doing two treatments a year and I still wasn't getting it dialed in enough. And I started doing three treatments a year. And you know what? The mites never build up to any significant level. And even when you know they're at the 3%, 4%, your bees still look good. But there's damage being done and your bees aren't as efficient. Let's just eliminate that damage altogether and keep them under control. That's just my opinion. And mix the treatments up. I don't just use one treatment of any type. But I'm hoping as we continue to experiment and guys like Bob continue to get even more involved than he's been. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot more people behind the scenes get involved. I'm excited. I'm seeing a lot more people get involved and motivated and that's how things will change and they're going to i'm going to lose my voice um this person asked why destroy drone brood aren't they necessary i i destroyed them just in this research test um, i i destroyed them because we were only given like a 22 day window of broodlessness and drone brood is a 24 day so when you, you go in, you, you scratch the drone brood and, and make sure that you just got to make sure that it's all eliminated so that all the mites are exposed because they love drone brood too, like several times more than they would a worker brood. So, whew. Mm. All right. Well, good, good questions. Lots of good stuff going on. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the works. There's men and women creating things behind the scenes. And some of the stuff I can't talk about, some of the stuff I can. Um, one thing I, I do want to mention before I get off is the highest four heroes. That's in Nebraska. Almost forgot. March the 5th. So what I'm going to be doing, I'll be live streaming via Zoom in Nebraska. But even if you can't go to Nebraska, it's in Lincoln. 
Um, you can still send support and donations to the veterans um, through Highs for Heroes if you want to be involved. Bob Benny is going to be up there. Ian and I will be streaming in, beekeeping with uh, Natalie. So Natalie Summers will be up there in person. Meet her and meet Bob. If you do, tell them I said, hey, I will be in Tennessee at the Tennessee Beekeepers Association um, giving lectures, and I'll be doing the Zoom meeting in between those lectures to Nebraska. So a lot of people think I'm actually going to be there. Um, I'll actually be in Murfreesboro at the TBA conference. And if you can be there, and especially if you're a Tennessean, please be there. We're trying to change things here in Tennessee significantly. And it takes an army to make positive change. And it, and we're starting to learn a little bit faster, but I, you know, I, I'm hearing voices from Europe and saying, hey, this is what works. I'm hearing voices in Tennessee saying, no, Cayman, you're doing it wrong. I'm hearing voices over here. I'm trying to be as open-minded as possible. So when I say this stuff about treatment-free and about bee weaver and stuff, realize that I don't know everything and realize that I'm still learning and I'm doing my best, but I'm just one person. And I'm just, I consider myself more of a messenger than a guru. Okay. So more of a messenger and I'm doing the best that I can, um, but I, I'm looking forward to spending more time with you all in the future. Thanks for spending your Saturday with me and we will see you soon. Thanks for watching this video. <laughs>